Welcome back into this special episode of In the Courts. Marijuana is a cash crop. States that have legalized it are reaping the benefits of the tax windfall that comes along with it. For example, in 2021, California says it raked in nearly $1.3 billion, that's billion with a B, in tax revenue. In Washington, D.C., the Tax Foundation says the district brought in more than $26.5 million in tax revenue. And where that money goes, it varies by state or district in D.C.'s case. But that same organization says Maryland stands to bring in an estimated $136 million once the operation is up and fully running. And in Virginia, the center square says the Commonwealth could net up to $308 million in tax revenue and create up to 18,000 jobs. Marijuana advocates say that's the goal, is to use that money to help fight crime and educate consumers. Last year, my state government got over $500 million of tax revenue earmarked for public health for law enforcement, for education, for good stuff, instead of gangs and organized crime. What's not to like about that? The numbers are in. Now, one local woman was a pioneer in the marijuana industry. Linda Mercado Green was one of the first black women to get a license legally to sell pot in the country. She now owns a thriving business east of the Anacostia River. And I had the chance to sit down with her to talk money, marijuana, and the future of the business. All right, Linda, you have been in this business for a while in D.C., but back when D.C. was one of the early movers on legalizing medical marijuana, there was still a lot that business owners had to do to be able to set up shop. High barrier to entry. What is the status now? How hard is it to get into this business? That has not changed. <laughs> and there have been a few, you know, alterations, but even when I got into my business, um, uh, you had to have um, a lease. Uh, you have to um, have a, a neighborhood approval, the ANC approval. Um, you should have letters of recommendation. Uh, you need to have your financials in order. Um, there's still a lot of barriers. Um, I wouldn't say barriers, but there are a lot of things that you have to do for a legal licensee. Does that make it difficult for people to get into this industry, particularly minority-owned business owners? Absolutely, it does. For one, the federal government has not federally legalized cannabis, which means that if you have to have a letter of intent or a lease, um, on where you plan to locate your operations, um, that could really um, be very hard to get because the owner of that property knows that you are operating a federally illegal business on their property and the FBI or DEA can actually come and uh, take their property in a minute. So, you know, that's really, really hard to do. And then, of course, you're going to pay a lot more than uh, just leasing it for a normal business because of the risk factors that they have to take as well. You were one of the first, I believe, 10 black women in the country to get a medical license yes. to own this type of business. You have been working in this for a while. One of those barriers to entry that is particularly problematic is where you bank, where you put oh. your money. Can you explain a little bit about what that issue is and is there anything being done about it? It is hard, it's difficult. We know that that has a direct link to the crime that is going on in our major cities um, where there are cannabis dispensaries, legal cannabis dispensaries, as well as illegal cannabis dispensaries. So um, the banking issue is that um, they are FDIC insured, so their ties in the federal government again. Um, and so some banks became uh, creative, or some entrepreneurs became created, uh, creative and formed banks just uh, to take cannabis money. So it's more like a depository. So we can, we can um, send our money to them, it's picked up by armored cars, and we can uh, write uh, checks for our vendors and pay our, pay our staff uh, through direct deposit. But you can't work with regular banks as, as you and I would walk in to open a checking account. We cannot, and we, that's why we are really hoping and pushing the Safe Banking Act. Um, it has been passed on the Cong uh, House of Representatives side seven times. It's in the Senate. So the Safe Banking Act 
One will allow us to bank at normal banks. Two, it will allow us to be able to get loans, to get grants, and the necessary things to operate our business that other businesses have access to. We don't have access to that. Even during COVID, when the PPP um, funds became available, right. the legal licensees could not apply for that even though we were always open, mm. we were deemed essential, right. but we could not apply for that because it's government funding. Well, let's talk a little bit about the status in D.C. before we let you go quickly here, because there are both medically licensed businesses, but also the gifting businesses. What's the difference when I walk into a store? It's a huge difference. When you walk into a legally licensed medical cannabis business in the District of Columbia, you are guaranteed safe medicine. You're guaranteed that medicine has been produced in the right um, settings, that it has been inspected, that there are no pesticides. And and you know from the labeling on that, you're getting exactly what it says. Uh, with the um, I-71 businesses um, in the District of Columbia, uh, they are not licensed to sell medical cannabis. The Initiative 71 Act uh, was approved um, uh, to, um, for D.C. residents to be able to uh, home grow, home use, and home share up to two ounces for no monetary value. So they took that no monetary value and says, okay, um, I'll get. give you a t-shirt and, right. and, you know, and do that exchange. But the issue is that the money is not recirculating back into our city because they're not paying taxes on that because they can't pay taxes on it. And you mentioned they were making exponentially more money than... Yes, so New Frontier businesses. Data stated last year um, uh, that the illicit market in D.C. Um, made over $600 million in revenue, and the legal market in D.C. only made $35 million in revenue. That's a big difference. That's a huge difference. And that's something that the mayor has also talked about cracking down on. That status of that uh, task force is something that's kind of up in the air at the moment, but mm -hmm. something that we'll keep an eye on. Well, Linda, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with thank us. We you. appreciate it. Thank you so much, Katie. Appreciate you.